greetings to all of you. Uh, I um, must say thanks to all uh, to participate in this very important uh, session, um, supporting the rights of women with disabilities. I'm Asha Funda Harmisti. I'm chairing this uh, session. Here uh, we have a very uh, delicious um, uh, participants and uh, uh, space. So speakers, so I um, want to uh, congratulate all of you and um, requesting to introduce yourself from my left side. Okay. A very good afternoon to all of you. I'm Dr. Mandeep Singh Malhotra. I'm a breast cancer surgeon at uh, New Delhi, India. Um, hi, good afternoon, everyone. I am Shalini Khanna, uh, Director of National Association for the Blind India, Center for Blind Women in New Delhi, India. And we both are uh, representing the project of discovering hands in India right now. Hello, my name is Liron David, and I'm from Enosh, the Israeli Mental Health Association, and we will be presenting the SEED project. Hello, I am Eric Cohen, and I am the director of Supportive Housing Models in Enosh. Hello, uh, my name is Monica Cortez, and I represent Asdown Colombia. I'm the director, and in this project, I represent the voice of the families and the person with intellectual disabilities that participate in our project. Hi, my name is Natalia Acevedo, and I'm the advocacy director of an organization called Profamilia, and we are experts on sexual and reproductive rights in Colombia. We'll be presenting the project My Sexuality, My Right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Judith Bart. I work as a research specialist at Light for the World, and we'll be talking about leadership development. Thank you, distinguished guests and speakers. Uh, I want to memorize on things that today is uh, 21st, the International Mother Language Day. I feel privileged that the day uh, is we of a uh, International Mother Language Day of my language, Bengali. Um, I think that uh, we uh, show honor to all of our uh, participants, and I am um, requesting you to fill up the time boundings because we have more speaker, and every organization we see there is two uh, two speakers. So. Uh, please coordinate yourself. I am um, inviting Monica Cortes and Natalia Asdo Cambodia and Prof. Profamalia. Okay. Um, where is the? How can I change the slides? Oh, I don't know. You you, you have Wish. this? Yeah. No. Thank you. Oh, yes, to come. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. My project, um, we're gonna talk about this project called My Sexuality, My Right. I am representing one of the four organizations that have joined forces to speak out about sexuality and um, disability rights. So this project aims to raise awareness about the sexual and reproductive rights of people with intellectual and psychosocial disabilities. Uh, we come from Colombia. And um, this project is under the inspiration of Article 23 of the CRPD. So you may wonder, why is it important to talk about sexuality when we have many other challenges in the disability rights field? So just some context information. There are many stereotypes about the sexuality of people with disabilities. Uh, for some people, it is still hard to imagine someone with an intellectual disability being a parent, falling in love, or having sexual desire. This is why many, especially women in the world, not only in Colombia, are still being forcibly sterilized. 
and I brought you some data about Colombia. From 2009 to 2018, over 7,700 people with disabilities were sterilized, and 86% of that number are women. So of course, this is a phenomenon that requires a gender perspective. Women with disabilities also face higher rates of sexual violence. And again, this is not only true in Colombia, but in many parts of the world. And I'm sure my colleagues here in this panel will speak about that. Also, there's lack of comprehensive sexual education, or the one that exists is not accessible for people with intellectual disabilities. And this is also true in the health perspective. So reproductive health services are not accessible or available for people with intellectual and psychosocial disabilities in Colombia. So this project uh, decided to unite these four basic and important stakeholders. One, people with disabilities that of course are in the center and the core of this initiative. Their families that are really important for the autonomy they can have to go to a service or to receive information about these topics. The health sector that must be available and accessible and decision makers. So I'm gonna tell you about the four strategies that we have been working throughout the last six years. So first, we have empower and we work training young leaders with disabilities around Colombia. Now we have over 120 leaders that have been trained and are self-advocates for their sexual and reproductive rights. In this, um, in this process, we, we talk about health, we talk about gender, we talk about the prevention of sexual violence, we talk about self-esteem and autonomy, among other specific topics such as contraception, um, and uh, participation, political participation. And this also permeates families. At the beginning of this project, back in 2013, Families were not happy with us talking about sexuality with their kids. Um, and at that time, it was really hard to get a group of leaders. We only have like four leaders interested. So this has been a journey and a really hard journey to get families to understand the importance of our approaching the topic of sexuality. Last year, we held the first sexuality encounter where we have young people coming from different parts of Colombia. Um, and we had the first festival, sexuality festival, that united families and people with disabilities. We got to create the co a comprehensive model for sexual and reproductive health services provision, and this model is based in the respect of confidentiality and autonomy. We believe people with intellectual disabilities can make decisions about their reproductive rights, and we created a tool to support this decision making. The tool can be available for anyone that can see, but it's an assessment tool that supports decision making in contraception and other important topics. From 2017 until 2018, we have provided many services, accessible services, uh, for people with intellectual disability, and as you can see, 39% of those services are for people with intellectual disabilities, among others. And Pro Familia is in 30, has 33 clinics around Colombia, so this is surely guarantees access throughout the country. Well, this is the tool, or like at least some of the pictures of the images that we use to support decision making. We have advocated for change, and on 2017, we got the Minister of Health of Colombia to enact a resolution that explicitly prohibits any kind of forced sterilization or procedures on people with disabilities, and makes supports and a consent mandatory for all health providers in the country. So, of course, this, this was not easy, and I'm just trying to be quick, but um, we got the law to change, and now we have to work on the implementation. 
Finally, we have done some research and knowledge production, such as one of these reports that you can find on our stand about sexual violence in Colombia. The important thing here is that we have been producing segregated data and specific data about women with disabilities and about minors and girls with disabilities because we didn't have it before. And to, make, to take decisions and to advocate, you need to have data. So this is also available at the end. Um, and also, uh, we want to share you what do we want to replicate in this uh, project. We want to replicate a comprehensive model that includes strategies to impact all the stakeholders that Natalia mentioned. How uh, sharing our knowledge and experience that we have built during the last six years. Also, we want uh, to share tools uh, and provide technical assistance to different actors. Uh, where we want to uh, scale up our practice in different regions of Colombia and in other countries uh, of Latin America. Uh, who are we looking for? Partners that work on gender and disability rights, health institutional uh, institutions that want to make services more inclusive for all, families and people with disabilities that want to talk about sexuality and reproductive rights, and finally, donors that want to invest in the replication and strengthening of this practice. How? Uh, now I want to leave you uh, with this quote uh, from 1992 by Anna Finger that represents the sense of our project. Read, Natalia. <laughs> I'm going to read it. Sexuality is often yes. yeah. Sexuality is often the source of our deepest oppression. It is often the source of our deepest pain. It's easier for us to talk about and formulate strategies for changing discrimination in employment, education and housing than to talk about our exclusion from sexuality and reproduction. Thank you for the space and I leave you with our contacts. Yes. I'm requesting uh, Petra to summarize this speech. about that. Let's talk about sex, right? Um, as you can see already on the slide, um, we heard that this project is all about my sexuality and my right. Um, to summarize it quickly, it supports women to say no against violence and yes to the right to give birth and have children and have their sexuality. It's also against um, forced sterilization, um, which is mostly a problem for women more than for men. So this forced upon sterilization. And your solution is to teach women to understand their sexuality. And they do that by talking about sex and um, having um, conversations and trainings where they really touch <laughs> and feel and understand uh, what sexuality might also mean for them. Um, and uh, if I c understood it correctly, it's targeting towards women with intellectual disabilities as a main focus. So um, at the end, they should be able to choose between no, I don't want sex, I don't want it forced upon me, or yes, I want to have sex, I want to have love, I want, w might want to have children, and you cannot force me for um, sterilization. So. Um, the women learn to choose if they want sex or not, right? Okay. I am cordially invited Judith Bard 
uh, light for the world to deliver her speech. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as many of you know in this room, I'm sure, women with disabilities are hardly represented in disability rights organizations, and persons with disabilities are hardly represented in women's rights organizations. This means that women with disabilities have no space and no place uh, where they can voice their concerns, and these concerns have the right to be heard. <coughs> now, Light for the World has been working in the disability rights sector for over 30 years, and we came across very few women, and particularly very few women of significant influence in this sector. And we wanted to address this. So we carried out research uh, and looked at leadership development programs. Um, and we found that very few were specifically addressing women with disabilities or were accessible to them. We also analyzed why women weren't included and used these as results to build our own leadership development program. We'd been working in Cambodia for many years and we thought that would be a good place to start. So in 2016, we launched the Women with Disabilities Leadership Program, whose aim was to increase the representation of women with disabilities in leadership positions in Cambodia. We uh, held an open recruitment process and asked women to apply, interviewed them, and started with a cohort of 25 women. Um, we carried out, between 2016 and 2018, we had about five workshops in Phnom Penh, and the women were allowed to bring in topics that they thought were interesting to discuss. In addition, we opened up a small grant facility. The goal of the grant facility was to put learning into practice and to give the woman the opportunity to learn and experience what it is like to take up a leadership position in a safe way. I'm going to start by talking about the results and then a little bit about what we think is important in leadership development. So after about two years, the first group of women had gone through the cohort and they reported many things, including increased self-confidence, increased leadership skills, increased advocacy, communication, and facilitation abilities, an increased network, and increased skills in project development and implementation. More importantly, over half of them had gained paid positions or had been promoted in their positions, and several have gained international scholarships to study abroad. Most importantly of all, all of them reported increased respect in their community. Some of them would say, I was used to be called by my disability in my place, and now they call me teacher, which is a term of respect in Cambodia. <clears throat> in addition, through the small grant program, the women have reached out to over 500 other women with disabilities throughout Cambodia. They have reached them through self-help groups, through training, through advocacy activities, awareness activities, uh, and meetings with the government, to advocate for access. During the program, we've also carried out research on what was happening in the program and why this was happening. And we came up with um, three important things that we think should be part of any leadership development program and that we think have led to the success. So what is absolutely essential? I think the first thing is that women need skills. You need some level of practical skills in order to be able to lead. And many of these women have had less access to education and less access to opportunities to learn, develop, and practice skills that they need. So during the workshops, we provided them with a whole range of skills. These included leadership skills, such as communication. These included more general program management skills, like how to budget or write proposals. And additionally, we also gave some general life skills, like first aid or sexuality. Interestingly enough, the women thought the last sector was really interesting. They would go back into their communities, um, and they would be the only person in that community that would know first aid, or that would know about sexuality, and start educating other people about it. And this gave them such an empowered feeling, you know, not only that they, as a woman with a disability, was the only person in that region that had this knowledge which is incredibly empowering. Um, the next thing is relationships and networks. So many of these women had been alone for a long time as a woman with a disability and didn't know any other ones. And being able to gather and to network with other women dis with disabilities was priceless to them. And many of them mentioned that this was really important to them. They, they, for the first time in their lives, they felt that they were not the only one. 
they enjoyed having role models and enjoyed you know, seeing other women and thinking, oh, if she can do it as a disabled woman, then of course I can too. And they felt supported. They built up a network. They held Facebook exchanges, and they called each other, and they were uh, friends by the end of this. Um, and so we specifically aimed to create bonds between the women by organizing informal social events. We'd go out for dinner. We'd have karaoke's um, to bring them together, and that would increase the bonding opportunities. Lastly, we believe that training doesn't work if learning isn't applied straight after training. And this is where the grant facility came in. So the women were able to apply for small grants. The goal of the grant was to reach out to other women with disabilities. And they had to go through the process to think, what do I want to do in my community to reach other women? Which is already a great start to learn about critical thinking and about analysis. Um, and it was a great way to ensure that learning became full time, because they would learn skills in a workshop and then immediately be able to implement it in their own communities with their own little project. And it was a great way also that they could then um, practice being a leader uh, in their communities and feel what it's like. What is also very important is that here we built in a very flat monitoring structure. So we asked the women themselves to set up the monitoring criteria for these programs. Um, we set up uh, peer visits so they would go and visit each other's programs and criticize each other's work and give feedback. Um, and what was powerful here is that, for the first time, this changed the power dynamics that's usually there, because there's usually a donor or a leader or a manager that tells them what they need to look for in success. And this time, they were the ones defining what they thought success was like. And one of the women um, that I spoke to told me that it was really powerful. You know, she'd always been visited by some manager from the city who came to her and told her what to do. And now for the first time, she was actually visiting someone else and going out and seeing what it could also be like. So here we have three factors that we think are absolutely crucial in leadership development programs, um, should we replicate it. So what now? We've had our first cohort of 25 women. And in 2018, last year, we recruited a new cohort of about 25 women. So we now have a large group of women, and we are covering almost all provinces from Cambodia. Um, the women themselves have decided to set up a network for women with disabilities in Cambodia. Um, they've applied for their first funding and got it, and they are working on setting up the first organization or network for women with disabilities in Cambodia. Um, and we think this is a great way to ensure sustainability of this. Um, I want to end by saying that I'm absolutely honored to have been part of this process and meeting these wonderful, powerful women who I'm sure are going to make a large impact in Cambodia. Thank you. Petra will summarize. So, uh, can you see? Right. Okay. Leadership program in Cambodia, um, promoted by Light for the World. Uh, the focus is to bring women with disabilities into the boss position, to make them become a boss or a leader. So, I imagine it's a door where my name is on there and I'm the boss. Um, and you, the, you did that by implementing a program where you teach women with disabilities uh, to become leaders and the result was that the women are more self-confident and they network a lot. So it turned out that um, we, together with the program you reached out also to other women who have not yet participated in the program and this whole networking situation has led to the conclusion for many that I'm not alone um, it's not only me, so it's also about finding friends and uh, having social relationships. And um, also a lot is about um, training, and training is particularly on leadership skills. Yeah. Oops. Not, not, but not only leadership, but also on things like um, first aid and sexuality. And uh, I heard this story about the women saying, hey, I'm the only one in my village, I'm the woman with a disability, and I'm the only one they can come to when it comes to sexuality and first aid. So what happens is that um, through also social events and partying together, um, 
women become very proud and the last word you said, and it's not very finished yet, was women are now powerful and, and uh, can be leaders and will be leaders. And um, we'll see what's going to come up next. Thank you. Thank you, Petra. Uh, I cordially invite Eric Cohen and Liron David Inos, the Israeli Mental Health Association. Good afternoon to you all. My name is Eric Cohen. And And, uh, and I honor uh, to be here uh, and uh, share with you our best practice. Enosh, the Israeli Mental Health Associ Associ Association is a nonprofit organization that aims to support people with psychosocial disabilities and their families members in Israel and promote their rights. Enosh provides various services for community mental health in nationwide in areas of supportive housing, supportive employment, and family counseling. In our services, we address the core needs of people that, so that they could lead a fulfilling and meaningful life. We are supported by the Israeli Ministry of Health. We constantly develop professional approaches that focus in personal growth and rely on lived experience. Research, research showed that more than 50% of women with psychosocial disabilities experience sexual assault during their lives. Yet, many mental health services cannot provide support for women who experience sexual trauma and cope with complex PTSD. Why, you ask? Well, when I started in, working in Enosh more than seven years ago, the professional attitude was focused in diagnosis based on a medical model of disability. The approach was focused in the recovery process in mental health system that didn't always reveal the actual needs of the participants. We understand today that we need to address some root causes of the symptoms. One of these root causes is sexual assault. Few years ago, a young woman came to our ser service with a background of several health, mental health diagnoses. Today we know that, that she was a victim of sexual abuse and the abuse was the main issue that needed solution. This is not an isolated case. We met many women with a similar background. At the time, Enosh started building training programs for pro professional and sexual trauma and mental health to build different support system. During the past four years, this idea became reality. Today, Enosh leads Seeds of Wellness, a supportive housing model that provides a comprehensive environment that sees the participants' needs through personal program. Each of the apartments accommodates three or four women with complex PTSD. Seeds is a comprehensive service delivered by professional staff experience on multidisciplinary methods. We support women's abilities to help them regain a sense of control that was lost because of the trauma. We provide a platform for peer support, tools and guidance to achieve milestones and provide boundaries that were constantly broken. We work to build up support system, including other services, family members, friends, and peers. We want to share with you two personal stories of Hagit and Yuval. ויחד ככה למדנו להכיר אותה ולראות מה עוזר לה, מה יכול לתרום בתהליך הזה. ויצאנו יחד למסע, צעד צעד. למדתי להכיר את עצמי. למדתי לבקש עזרה למרות שזה עדיין קשה לי. למדתי להיפתח לאנשים, לתת אמון. אז כיום אני אחרי שלוש וחצי שנים שגרתי בדיור, אני גרה בדירה עצמאית, ומקבלת עדיין ליווי של אנוש. 
אני אדירה מותאמת לבנות שמתמודדות עם תסמינים של קומפלקס PTSD, פוסט-טראומה מורכבת, ועבודה שנעשית בדירה היא פרטנית וקבוצתית. כשיובל התחילה לראות בדירה מקום בטוח, אז התהליך ככה התחיל לחלחל והיו שינויים שראינו בצורה מאוד מובהקת. פחות שימוש באובדנות, יותר שיח, יותר יכולת להחזיק ולתמלל את הרגשות שלה. אני חושבת שאם לא הייתה את הדירה, הייתי ממשיכה פחות או יותר באותו קו שהייתי, שזה לצאת מאשפוז מאוד מאוד מבולבלת ולא מסתכלת על עצמי. מסתכלת על מה רוצים ממני, על מה אני צריכה לרצות. בעצם לא היה סוג של יובל פנימית. זה היה ממשיך יובל של כולם, בלי באמת אני. השינוי שעבר בדירה זה בעצם תהליך מטורף בעיניי, ולקחתי משם המון תקווה והנבנה של לא משנה מה קורה, בין אם זה רגשות, בין אם זה שערות רגשות, ללכת עם זה ולהבין שיהיה בסדר. הסיפור של יובל הוא סיפור הצלחה, ואני גאה על כך בוחרת. הדירות הקבוצתיות של אנוש נועדו לתת מענה שיקומי לצעירות שמתמודדות עם טראומה מורכבת. בנות מקבלות מענה פרטני וקבוצתי, מאפשר להן לרכוש במקום בטוח כלים להתמודדות עם הסימפטומים, לצורך קיום חיים מלאים ובעלי משמעות. I want to talk to you about the impact. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, I want to talk to you about the impact of our model. Uh, as you all seen in the movie, there is a significant impact on the personal level. It is a life-changing program. But we need to remember that it is not a linear process. Relapse happen. Chagit, the chair their story in the movie, had a relapse after participating in it. This is not a singular case of relapse. Other participants in our services also have setbacks. But aren't we all? The important thing is that we are there to help them stable their life and use the setback to grow. It is a marathon run. Another important part of the impact is the change in the professional attitudes in regard to sexual trauma because of our trainings. It is a joint journey that both the staff and the participants are walking together. A change of attitudes, values, beliefs in regarding to the issue. The success facilitates partnerships and networks that promote the participants' inclusion in society. So we are very proud to receive this year's Zero Project Award and participate in the Impact Transfer Program because sexual trauma is a worldwide problem. So does mental health. You already know that 50% of the women with psychosocial disabilities need SEEDS program in their lives. Trauma-informed trainings and services models can make huge difference Our vision from a few years ago turned into evidence-based practice that can be replicated worldwide. We look for partners from other countries to join us for this journey and promote the vision of zero barriers for women with psychosocial disabilities and continue developing the model. We want to thank you, and you can meet us outside after this lecture. Thank you. Always not very colorful, but not so quick. <laughs> uh, nevertheless, Seeds of Wellness, yeah, Seeds, the Seeds program um, from Israel, is focusing on women with psychosocial disabilities. And you said that the root cause of most of these disabilities is sexual abuse. So what you did is in order to make sure that the trauma and the stigma that the women are facing is being addressed mostly based on um, sexual abuse they have encountered throughout their lives. Um, the solution is that you have professional staff um, that 
at the end, we also heard they have a change in attitude now towards the people they are supporting. And I hope this will look nicer later on. It's supposed to be a hand sh sheltering the house, <laughs> yeah? Um, to show that you provide sheltered housing for traumatized women so that they can feel safe again. And you also provide centers, different kinds of centers. I heard um, family centers and counseling and I think also youth centers. And the impact, there's a lot of big impact on the women and you want to spread that around the world and are looking for partners, is that women are reintegrated into the society and feel now part of it and they feel strong and um, have a better life, right? I cordially invited uh, Shalini Khanna and Mandeep Malhotra in AB India Center for Blind. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so uh, we are presenting something about right to employment for blind women in India. Um, Blind women are almost um, 2.3 million in number in India, more than blind male, and it's almost the largest number in the world for any disability. Uh, it's also been not very easy for them to get employments in face of the unsafe civil environment as we keep hearing about India. They face neglect, they face abuse, they face deprivation of education and employment. Less than 5% of blind women are employed and they don't have access to technical education and, and skills in India. And poverty and disability is almost hand in hand and due to the poverty situation they are always at the last rung of the pyramid to receive any support. Uh, we are presenting here a very niche model where they become the providers from the receivers. Uh, women's health and livelihood both are a very, very bleak scenario in India right now. Um, while I just told you about the blind women in India, also, Breast cancer, it ranks about number one cancer among Indian females and the projected number for 2020 is 1.7 million women will have breast cancer. They present themselves late and therefore out of every two women detected with breast cancer, one woman is projected to die. She presently dies one out of every two women detected with breast cancer in India because of the late presentation. And why she presents herself late to the doctors is lack of awareness and screening. There's, there's absolutely no screening available right now in India of the breasts. And to talk about breasts in India is, is very taboo. To talk about sexuality, to talk about breasts is very taboo. So talking about breast health is almost absent. Nobody is talking to her about breast health and she is not going to talk about breast health to anyone. So the deaths, the number of deaths keep increasing by the day. Uh, I'm sorry, does this go back? Yeah, sorry. Discovering Hands, a project which actually came from Germany, has found an amazing fit to preserve this right of employment for blind women because she happens to be just the right person to protect this breast health for women. It's an innovative and diagnostically superior breast examination method by training blind women as skilled tactile diagnosticians to bring much needed breast screening 
It was brought in India by uh, NAB India Center for Blind Women in 2016, thanks to all the funding support by Bayer Crop Science. And we have about first batch of seven blind women certified as, a, certified as medical tactile examiners right now. They've become from receivers, they've, they've actually taken a journey to become the providers. The essence of this whole project is to help blind women in India from being perpetual receivers and being on the charity side always to receive employment, just to be able to earn not even two square meals a day, to actually become service providers in hospitals. The project trains them to use their highly developed sensory and tactile skills to examine and detect the minutest abnormalities in the breast. And it's a manual, affordable, and repeatable pre-screening option for women of all age groups. They're so that the screening tool is available now to prevent the women from reaching a very advanced stage. It's, it's, an, it's an early breast cancer detection model. It also prevents the privacy of a, of a woman because she feels very comfortable being checked by a blind woman inch by inch on her breast. And I have Dr. Mandeep Singh with me who uh, is a testimony, he's a breast cancer surgeon and they have very nicely accepted this model of these, the screening by blind women in India. I would like him to speak a little about how it is the best fit to screen the breast cancer by blind women. Uh, thank you, Shalini. And I want all of you to notice that why I am a part of it. I am a part of it because I look forward for the blind woman to actually provide solution to me. My problem in, in India is that 50% of the women, when, I, when they come to me, they're already at advanced stage of breast cancer. Out of two women I operate, one dies of breast cancer, one dies of the disease in spite of all my efforts. And the peak age of incidence of breast cancer is 40 years. As you all know, mammogram is the screening modality, but the mammogram is only applicable around the age of 45 years. So at 40 years, when a woman dies of breast cancer, there is actually no awareness, and even if I have a screening modality like mammogram, I cannot use it. So this is where the blind women, I don't want to call them as blind, I want to call them as visually enabled. Because of their visual imperity, they, have, they don't have visual, but they have better tactile sensations. And their tactile sensations are better than my visually enabled tactile sensations. I want to just uh, uh, want you to focus on, like, if, there's a breast examination which me as a clinician would do. I would, what, what I would do is that there is a certain breast lump. I would focus on that lump. I would check like this, I would check like this, I would check like this, I would never check like this. So the point is that my, since I'm visually enabled, my touch is inferior to those who are visually enabled. Secondly, I'm visually enabled, so I might try to skip. Okay, this is fine, this is fine. Oh, this is okay, this is okay, this is okay. So I might tend to skip certain things. Whereas when a blind or a visually uh, impaired woman examines a waist, she follows these braille dots. This is a doco strip developed by Dr. Frank Hoffman. So this, they uh, follow from this dot to this dot. So they'll examine like this, 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 and they give three cent pressure gradings. And so, they are not missing anything. I would say that I, would, I found uh, it's real eye-opening to me. I tend to miss. My ultrasonologist would use a probe, use a probe. She might miss, but these medical tactile in, in, uh, examiners or these blind women don't miss because they have to follow the dots. So they examine every centimeter of the breast, and what they help me to do is they help me to detect breast cancer at an early situation. And that is how I tend to save lives. So for the first time, the blind women will be able to save lives. Thank you. Amazing. Of us who are visually enabled. So this 
this uh, particular slide shows you that findings with self-examination will find out a lump of 25 millimeter size by this time. Dear speaker, time is over. Okay, that's the last slide. By this time, it's already to, uh, that stage. Findings with clinical breast examination by gynecologist is almost the second stage or first stage with 10 to 20 milliliter of lump. But what an MT, a blind MTE finds is six to eight millimeter, which could be stage zero or stage one. And that is how she saves life. Thank you. She's already checked, we've already checked 400 women in India and we really look forward to more partnerships with hospitals and better training and awareness in the country. Thank you so much. Waiting for the camera. And as soon as we're online, here we go. Yeah, um, discovering hands means that hands are discovering breast cancer. And it's not any kind of hands, it's the hands of blind women. And you um, gave us a bit of an idea about the situation of blind women in India. First of all, it's a large number and most of them are dependent on support and they don't make their own living. And the other problem is that a lot of women um, suffer from breast cancer and so the solution is actually for both groups. It's for blind women and for women with breast cancer. And if they're being brought together with Discovering Hands, uh, we see the following. We see that uh, women who are visually impaired, who are blind, um, they have extraordinary skills in detecting um, knots within the breast. Um, not only that, but this particular skill is very useful, so they become service providers instead of being receivers of any support. So they become their own um, uh, supporters, so they can earn their own money, yeah, have their own income, and um, they can make a very good environment for women who get the examination because women feel comfortable, more comfortable with a blind woman who is touching her breast rather than maybe a male doctor. And um, the detection is also more precise. So, um, we saw an example on how this is being done and the breast is being analyzed with the hands of a blind woman and that helps to save lives because of this early detection uh, in a stage where maybe a um, technical examination wouldn't even find the problem. So, um, blind women are saving lives and making a living. That's a very nice project. Thank you. Thank you so much, Petra, and we'll say the speakers from Colombia, Cambodia, Israel, and India. Now I uh, want to open the floor for the participants if you bring any questions to the speaker. Before that, I use a word delicious because the subject is such interesting, complicated, and important as food is. Thank you. Uh, if uh, you have any question, then open, uh, up your hand. Microphone will go. But I am I requesting to give you uh, the time limits. Please consider short question. I was very impressed with a woman who talked about helping people learn how to write a grant proposal. Uh, it's very difficult to sustain uh, programs to help women with disabilities. How are you training your team to raise money to make it sustainable? And what are you doing to enable women with disabilities themselves to lead these organizations? Uh, we can take question and then answer, okay? Yeah. 
Uh, yes, I'm, I, I want to know briefly if you can explain the, how the blind women are trained for, for detecting uh, breast cancers. I mean, just short, short one. Thanks. Then uh, India. Hi, and thanks for your question. Um, so, um, as I explained in my presentation, we have these workshop sessions, and this is where the practical skills come in. Um, we have our own team of facilitators who have uh, organized the sessions, and where necessary, we bring in skilled experts from other places and other organizations. Um, so we have people coming in from Mary Stopes about sexuality, someone coming in from a mental health organization to talk about counseling. So we bring in experts as needed to talk about um, different skills. Um, and many of the skills that we uh, organize in these uh, workshops are skills that these women have identified um, wanting to learn more about. So they'll come to the next workshop and say, hey, we really want to learn more about this because this is what we're struggling with as we're trying to implement our grant program. Uh, the grant programs are really small budget, um, but they do go through the whole process of you know, writing a proposal, learning how to set up a monitoring system, needing to report on it, needing to budget on it. Um, and for many of the women, this is absolutely the first time they've been in charge of um, and being part of this process, and they're learning so much from that. Regarding raising money, um, so um, when it comes to setting up the first women's network, that is mostly their own initiative to do so. Um, but we have a staff member that is available for mentoring and coaching and that really supports them along in the process and is there for them. India, please. Thanks for your question. So this training is about um, nine months in India. In Germany, it's six months. Um, and nine months plus three months of internship in a hospital to work with an oncosurgeon. Um, firstly, the blind girls are trained on uh, science concepts. In India, surprisingly, or maybe in other countries also it happens, the blind people or blind children are not educated in science above eighth class stream because there is a lack of trained trainers, I'm sure in many countries, to teach science to blind children. So uh, there are specially trained trainers from Germany to train blind girls on breast, totally in focus. Um, doctor sitting with me will uh, witness that not even gynecologists in India study breast in that much detail as they are trained in detail to examine the breasts, to know about all the terminologies concerned with breast, to know the causes of cancer, types of cancer and to identify the form and sizes of lumps. That training takes, a, takes six months, totally only on the breast. Um, thanks to Dr. Ho Frank Hoffman, these tapes uh, were devised. These are braille tapes. You can see only white, black, and red colors. But each square, each cent this is centimeter by centimeter a tape. Each square is a centimeter each, and it has different braille dots, each square. There are only three squares. She doesn't have to do much. She just has to identify three squares. And from one black to another black, the dot difference, there is 10 centimeters. So she knows how to cut her tapes. A very extensive training on how to paste these tapes on the body or on the breast of a woman so that her measurements are absolutely precise, inch by inch. And this, this also takes a lot of tactile practice. So before we begin the training, there is a five-day long assessment of each girl, whether her tactile senses are, are good or not. That's the only criteria. We train her in English and computers, everything. But that's being blind is the only criteria. A sighted person will not really be able to work very well on it. And once they are trained on theory about the whole breast, they, uh, and they are also trained, uh, taught by doctors on the breast, then they go for three months every day, they intern under breast cancer surgeons to check the patients and to be in the real life situation of a hospital. Um, they talk to the patients, they make 
they, they're trained to make patients feel comfortable and counsel the patients. And then, you know, um, once they have checked, they tell the doctor whatever is the problem, and the doctor goes and talks to them, uh, to the patients. But um, the doctors are very surprised to see that the girls are actually able to even tell whether the lump that they have figured is malign or not. They actually are trained that well on the lumps. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Any more question? You have microphone here? Yeah, okay. Hi, my question is for uh, Inosh. Um, so if you're finding that women have um, multiple mental health diagnoses, um, and then you find that the root of that is the sexual trauma, after they go through their programs, are you finding that they were misdiagnosed? So, um, hi, thank you for the question. Sometimes it is the case, not always, mm -hmm. but after we trained our staff um, to address the question of sexual trauma, um, instantly the cases came and uh, became more and more in our awareness. So they were there, but nobody asked those women, and those men, by the way, if they ever had a sexual assault in their lives, or if we should know something about their sexual history. And after you change the awareness of staff, they came to us, to uh, the leading staff, and, and said, hey, we need to change our interviews in the beginning when a, when a participant comes. We need to ask those questions that we didn't even thought about before we had this training program. Um, so that's what I, why we said before, that it's like changing the perception of professionals uh, that address the mental health services um, in, in our services, but it can also change you know, perception of uh, psychiatrists in hospitals and uh, other mental health uh, services, and also other services for different, uh, totally different disabilities, because it's, it's not just women with psychosocial disabilities that are being um, traumatized. It's all over the world and all over the disability fields. Thank you very much. Uh, should we close our session? I thank you all of uh, the participants uh, for your patience. And also, I want to congratulate again our speakers uh, to uh, bring so many issues in the table. And I think that it is well discussed. Thank you so much. Thank you.